It's my nerd world, a Star Wars show, and I hope you had a fantastic Thanksgiving, Gobble Gobble. On the show this week, we'll talk uh, Andor's finale. Tony Gilroy, the showrunner, provides some details into season one, Gobble Gobble. Bob Chapek, CEO of Disney, who replaced Bob Iger, is out. Bob Iger is back, at least for two years. I'll give you details on what this might mean for the future of Star Wars content, including Gobble Gobble. Five years of movies being planned, but is Kathleen Kennedy on her way out, Gobble Gobble? Plus, we have your listener feedback to get into, Gobble Gobble. Thank you so much for checking out the show this week. I really do appreciate it. Let's not waste any more time, Gobble Gobble. Let's get right to it. Nothing will stand in our way. I find your lack of faith disturbing. I will finish what you started. Who are you? I'm no one. There are stories about what happened. It's true. All of it. The Force. It's calling to you. My nerd road. Just let it in. It is my nerd world, and welcome to it, a Star Wars show. I am your host, John Justice. And again, thank you so much for taking time out and checking out this week's uh, episode. Let's not waste any time and get into... The season finale, season one finale of Andor. Right up front, what did you think? Drop me an email, talkshownerd at gmail.com, or leave a comment up on YouTube if you happen to be uh, watching uh, the show there. Look, I loved the finale. Um, I loved the in, the entire show. In terms of Star Wars live action content, uh, it is one of the best pieces of Star Wars uh, live action content that we've seen so far. The only thing that I would probably put abo- above it is the Mandalorian, as I've talked about on previous uh, previous episodes. And I am curious from my own fandom's perspective, or from my own fandom and and my desire to go and rewatch Star Wars content, how often I will be returning to to Andor. I feel like it's one of those shows where. It's going to be more of a sort of once a year visit as opposed to the way that I consume other Star Wars content. I want to get back into briefly what I said a couple of episodes with regard to whether or not Andor will become classic Star Wars. I do have quite a bit of listener feedback uh, to share with you uh, with regard to that. But now that we have season one finished, I'm sticking with my opinion on this. More pointedly, Andor isn't growing the fandom certainly isn't going to be grabbing younger viewers. That doesn't mean the show wasn't great. Uh, the show was absolutely fantastic. Uh, but the future isn't and or specifically. I- I'm of the opinion that the future of Star Wars is and or quality. And or quality is the future of Star Wars. The production level of and or is hands down the best of any of the live action streaming content so far. I'd even go so far as to say that while the cinematography choice was very specific, I love the look and feel of Andor more than, say, Solo, a Star Wars story, which had a very specific aesthetic to it. But Andor could have easily, if it was a movie, could have easily be shown up on the big screen and you would not lose any sense of quality. Whereas if you were to take any number of the other live-action shows, and I just don't think it holds up. Maybe The Mandalorian, although going back and re-watching some Mandalorian episodes while consuming week by week the Andor series, the TV quality of The Mandalorian definitely sticks out more just because of how great Andor looked. By example, too, I was... um, getting ready to head for bed and I was going to be going to bed about in about a half hour the other night. I've had kind of a mini vacation this week with the Thanksgiving holiday and um, didn't know what I wanted to watch before I went to bed. So I'm like, you know what? I'll throw on the Obi-Wan Kenobi finale, right? It's got the, the, the lightsaber fight between, between Vader and Obi-Wan and I'll just, I'll toss that on and I'll watch that. Honestly, 
Um, I I couldn't. It looks like a fan film compared to the quality of Andor. And that sucks because it had elements that could have been great. If Obi-Wan Kenobi had the same level of production, um, and in my opinion, better directing, it, it would have been spectacular. But going and, and watching Obi-Wan Kenobi now after watching Andor, and it actually is really tough to to watch, even from a special effects level. And again, this is all subjective, just me personally. But getting back to, to Andor, I love what the show did. Do not misunderstand. And I'll get into a little bit more of this in listener feedback with some of your with some of your comments. But Andor, while it is absolutely fantastic, again, I don't think it's growing the fandom. It is pleasing the fandom. And when you look at the future of Star Wars, there, you know, there has to be content out there that's going to be able to grab younger viewers. And clearly there will be content coming out that will go and do that. Skeleton Crew seems as if that show is very much tailored to try to grab onto younger viewers. And so that wasn't Andor's job. I completely understand that. But just keeping with this idea of will Andor be, you know, the future, everything will just be like Andor. I just don't believe that's the case. Andor is in and of itself what it's supposed to be, appealing to a more adult audience than a lot of other Star Wars content. But because of that, it's never going to reach that sort of classic Star Wars um, level that is loved and enjoyed by all by all ages. So, and again, I'll get into a little bit more uh, of this coming up later on in the episode when I dive into uh, listener feedback. There has been an awakening. Have you felt it? All right, I don't want to spend a ton of time on this, but it's going to have an impact on Star Wars content in the future. So, for those that aren't aware, I think it was about three or four years ago, uh, Bob Iger stepped back as CEO of Disney. Eventually was just a board member, and then I think even left the board at one point in time. His successor was Bob Chapek, who took over right as the pandemic started. Had a very, very difficult task of having to navigate Disney from all its different entities through this event that you know we'd never experienced before. Bob Iger, for those that aren't aware, is more of a content kind of guy. Bob Iger, you would see attached to, quite often, photographs and video of, specifically when it comes to Star Wars content. He seemed very hands-on, was very opinionated about Star Wars content, whereas Bob Chapek, from what we know, was more of a numbers guy, which makes sense from the standpoint that what Disney was having to deal with, uh, having theaters shut down, having theme parks shut down, it was good to have a Bob Chapek at the helm. That being said, from my perspective, Disney was really starting to feel like it did under the Michael Eisner years. And for those that remember, um, as an example, Eisner brought on this plethora of straight-to-video sequels to Disney content, really diminished the brand quality of Disney during his latter time as being CEO of the corporation. Under Bob Chapek, Disney not only having to deal with the pandemic, was also having to deal with controversies coming out of Florida, upset employees, and not being a content guy. I don't have any proof of this. However, you look at what Disney Plus has been doing. Um, with And it was, for me personally, it was really starting to look like what happened under Eisner. You had a lot of the, the, yeah, you had a lot of sequels that were coming to the Disney Plus channel. Mighty Ducks, Hocus Pocus, Disenchanted, um, diminished in overall uh, quality. Uh, then you had the quality of Star Wars content, specifically Obi-Wan Kenobi, to a lesser extent, uh, Book, of Boba, uh, Book of Boba Fett. I don't think that those shows would have made it past the quality check of a Bob of a Bob Iger. Um, from what we're being told, Bob Chapek is partly responsible for the lack of Star Wars movies in the theaters. And, of course, we all know the, the difficulty that it seems Disney has been having in locking down any one film. We have another rumor here 
of sort of the ramp up of the next five years of Star Wars movies as directors have come and gone. So Bob Iger was apparently um, asked by the board at Disney to come back. Bob Chapek's out. Bob uh, Iger is back, and he has two years to right the, sh- the the Disney ship. And I, look, I'm excited about this just from a content consumer because Disney for me, for a lot of different reasons, was really starting to feel like any other random entertainment company. Before, Disney had a certain level of quality to it and expectation of quality, and it was above everybody else. But with the diminished quality that we've seen of some of the products, um, their you know their content that they've been putting out with their angle as it relates to social issues and the injection of a lot of woke content into their products. Uh, again, it was just feeling like any number of other uh, entertainment companies out there. And Bob Iger, I think, will be the guy. I don't know if two years is going to be enough, but to get it back on track, and specifically as it relates to Star Wars, because it is still clear that the the big money earners are on the big screen. And with, by example, uh, Lucasfilm and Disney deciding to put out Andor on other streaming platforms. I was actually just scrolling through uh, this morning as I was watching TV because I got a few days off. And, you know, I saw that Andor, the first couple of episodes of Andor were playing on FX. And they're going to be landing on other streaming platforms other than Disney to try to expand the reach of that of that show. And I understand why it's a really good show, but clearly that is an indication to me that the show isn't garnering the same types of numbers that Obi-Wan Kenobi, Book of Boba, and The Mandalorian uh, did. Even despite what is, in my opinion, a a um, a lackluster production on some of those some of those shows. And again, that speaks back to my view that it's not going to become and or it's not going to become classic Star Wars, even though it is a fantastic show. So I'm excited that Bob Iger is back and what this means, especially as it relates to Star Wars on the big screen, because I'm very, very much of the opinion that that is where uh, Star Wars needs to be needs to be seen and how the franchise is going to continue to to grow is uh, epic tales, epic stories told up on the big screen. Park that'll light the fire that'll burn the first order down. All right, we have a couple of stories here from Star Wars News Net, spe- uh, specifically talking about the future of Star Wars on the big screen. According to the latest rumor from Jeff Snyder, who is a um, movie commentator, right? He just he, he follows he follows Hollywood Hollywood news and has broken big stories before. Star Wars fans won't have to wait long before the franchise returns in a big way to cinemas. After three quiet years when it comes to Star Wars film news, even though we've had a lot of secondhand announcements of Star Wars projects, nothing has been solidified. It appears development on new theatrical releases has definitely picked up, and a solid slate could be ready in the near future if the latest word from renowned uh, Hollywood and reporter scooper Jeff Snyder is to be believed. Now, the newest rumor comes as claims uh, comes um, at, with claims that Kathleen Kennedy has the next few years of Star Wars figured out, including definite projects on the feature side. The comment that he made said basically that that Star Wars fans have a lot to be um, excited about, and I'll give you some more details of this in a moment. When you actually hear the comment, it was its context was fairly benign. And he was very casual in the way that he made this comment. But, of course, I'm making a bit of hay out of it, as are a lot of other shows out there. But according to Snyder, there's a lot of stuff coming down the pipe on the feature side at Lucasfilm to be excited about. As we all know, Lucasfilm has made a strong pivot to the TV side of things in order to beef up Disney+, Plus, and those plans aren't going anywhere with several new Star Wars series and seasons deep into development and production. So you've got... Uh, Mandalorian Season 3 coming out. We have Bad Batch Season 2 coming out. We have Ahsoka uh, that is uh, coming out. Acolyte has begun filming. Skeleton Crew, as I mentioned. But it also appears the studio knows there's a strong desire for more theatrical releases after a post-Episode 9 hiatus that's been longer than anticipated. Um, You might recall Patty Jenkins' Rogue Squadron was supposed to come out in Christmas next year. That's now undated. Now, whether this updated slate of Star Wars projects for the next five years or so 
includes yearly theatrical releases. Once things are back up on the feature side, we could be looking at 2024 at the earliest. We don't know for sure. This could just mean there's a strong roadmap in place for both TV and the theatrical side of Lucasfilm, as the general sentiment uh, sentiment at Disney after Solo, a Star Wars story, underperformed was that maybe they had released to too many films too fast. However, many insiders and fans feel like the marketing and release dates simply weren't the best and believe that Star Wars could thrive in cinemas, putting out a new installment each year. I absolutely agree with that. Solo was an anomaly. And it was marketed poorly. I agree with what a lot of other people say in that, for those that don't remember, we had The Force Awakens followed in a few years by, and then we had Rogue One, and then we had The Last Jedi. Those all came out over the holidays, which bums me out too, because as we head into the holidays, I really do miss having Star Wars hype surrounding my Christmas holidays. I really, really enjoyed that, and so... I find myself even more so than I typically do gravitating towards Star Wars during the holidays, especially during vacation, just because it has that holiday feel for me, especially those three movies I just mentioned. Then they released Solo A Star Wars Story in March, and the marketing around that movie was bad. It should have been released later in the year. If they had put it out at in, over the holidays of that particular year, which would have been, oh, no, I don't even remember. What year that would have been? <laughs> I guess 20, 2018? Um, I think that it would have done a lot better than it did. But it didn't do very well in the box office, and Disney got scared, and we got one more movie after that, being The Rise of Skywalker, and that was it. So back to the story. As it stands, and despite recent cancellations, we know at least three different films are in active development. Taika Waititi's long gestating project, a supposedly post-Rise of Skywalker standalone created by Damon Lindelof, and Kevin Feige and Ma- Michael Waldron's secret film, which could be the same that Sean Levy has joined. If that's not the case, then we're looking at four potential films in the near future, five if Rogue Squadron comes back to life. And I... You know, in my opinion is the storytelling needs to be connected. It's been a while now since we've had that apart from live action TV shows. Um, just in terms of the length of time since we had a Star Wars movie on the big screen. But I believe Star Wars thrives with storytelling that reaches across multiple films. That's where the fandom gets hyped. That's where the speculation comes in. That's how the fandom grows, and despite the controversy surrounding the sequel trilogy, when you look at just the chatter around Star Wars, it still was much stronger during those film years of the sequel trilogy than it ever has been among the conversation around the Disney streaming platforms. That's not to say that there isn't fandom conversations around the streaming platforms, but it's just not nearly as hyped as theatrical releases. TV is always going to be TV, and movies are always going to be movies. This is not going to go the way you think. All right, we have uh, some comments from Tony Gilroy with regard to uh, the first season of Andor. He sat down with the uh, outlet Collider and gave the following explanation on a couple of things within the show, in case you were curious. I thought it was interesting. But um, he explained why the show features fewer aliens than any other Star Wars series or movie before. And he says, in some places, people are saying, oh, why is uh, Narkeena 5 all humans? Well, I don't know how you would work out the bathroom on the floor with eight different varieties of genital genitals or whatever. I mean, it has to be that way. A system like that, maybe there's Narkina 2 where there's different things. We're probably a little bit shy about it because it's such a behavioral show. And most of our principles are in this particular world. And certainly the Empire doesn't have a surplus of aliens on their side. There's some in season one, and we'll probably have more. It's a very strong flavor when it comes in. It's not just a visual flavor. It's a very strong character flavor. You have to deal with it politically. We will have more, and we'll have them in appropriate places. We try to pick our shots and make them cool, I guess. And really, when it comes to the to the um, the ratio of humans to aliens, 
Um, Andor fits tonally with the original trilogy just because of the, uh, in my opinion, just because of the limitations of the technology of the day. With Andor now, they're certainly making a choice to specifically include aliens only in particular areas. But when you go and watch the original trilogy, while you had the cantina and you had a smattering of aliens here and there within the rebellion, certainly it wasn't as uh, many as the prequel trilogy or to a lesser extent the sequel trilogy. And Andor feels like it falls in line with the ratio in the original trilogy, which I also think you know, adds to the appeal for a lot of older fans, even beyond the more mature content. I didn't mention this before in my commentary talking about the finale, but I really do love the arc that they gave to Cassie and Andor. Uh, the show was called Andor for a reason, and I was very interested and engaged throughout the first, the first season to see how Andor gets to the place where we eventually see him in... Rogue One. Uh, we certainly see him act in murderous ways, as we did in Rogue One, but his reluctancy to join the Rebellion in, in uh, Season 1 had me very, very interested to see how he gets to that spot where he joins the Rebellion. And they really did just nail it in that finale. With that closing scene, spoiler alert here, if you haven't seen it already, skip ahead about a minute. But that moment on the Fondor Hallcraft, a ship which I absolutely adore, with Luthen, where basically he just says, after his mom doing that thing with my fingers, after her death, basically says, you know, either take me, I'll join the rebellion, or kill me. I mean, you can't get much more committed than that. And the, the, the writing in that show was just absolutely spot on. Um, about season two, getting back to the Collider piece, Gilroy confirmed the first episode will pick up a year after the final scene of season one. It's a year later after what you just saw. A great deal has happened in the interim. Additionally, Gilroy was asked about whether or not season two will include K uh, K2SO, Cassian's unlikely companion from Rogue One. He says, well, I think it's one of the possibilities of part two. Obviously, we're going to walk into Rogue. We'll have to deal with that and there's also been some commentary around how they'll there, there will be a lot more familiar figures in uh, in season two um but again overall just masterful show absolutely masterful show for an older star wars um audience and i think andor will be the one show that is tailored that way i don't expect further star wars content to follow the same tone and maturity as Andor. I think Andor serves that purpose and it serves that purpose well. So as always, what do you think? Talk show nerd at gmail.com or leave a comment up on YouTube and I'll share those comments on next week's show. Something inside me has always been there. But now it's awake and I need help. And you've written me listener feedback for this week, and I want to share it with you. First off, a uh, friend of the show, Miranda Alicia, writes, I would like to think that the Andor series, to me, was more about focusing and emphasizing a deeper concept of the humanity of Star Wars, making it about people, the people on both sides, as well as tackling the themes of light and dark without lightsabers of the Force being a part of it. And Rogue One was very much in the same vein, obviously. Uh, my comment there. Uh, it's seeing the light and dark side of humanity, of mankind, and the ugliness that comes from the corruption and greed and fascism and seeing the beauty of hope, love, loyalty, perseverance in the midst of it all. There's a good chance next season could start to have a little bit more of the classical traditional Star Wars, the things that we enjoy immensely about it, in addition to the fact that it's still candidly, first and foremost, a space fairy tale and a huge fantasy world that has everything you expect and want in a fantasy world. This recent episode packed a punch and will bring out the waterworks, but I also believe it's setting up for the season finale, talking about last week's, uh, in a very interesting place that will finish on a potential cliffhanger note that makes us anxious enough to want the second season right away, and that's exactly how it should be. This is the way. Yeah, I wouldn't... Um... And Miranda, and thank you for the comment, as always, friend of the show. Uh, I I wouldn't have called um, the uh, the end of the episode a cliffhanger. 
Uh, certainly, I think you know the understanding is Andor is going to live because we already know when he when he uh, when he dies. I am curious because, like, watching as I mentioned before, that uh, at least a part of it, the Obi Wan season finale. Um, like there was a, and I know I'm being really critical of Obi Wan, but I just I'm, I'm just being honest with you. We can, it's all subjective. If you loved it, that's great. But just me personally, uh, it just had this fan film feel about it and especially watching the scene of the grand inquisitor and darth vader on the bridge of the star destroyer it just wasn't it was coming off as very very cheap i wonder how vader will would feel and look in andor because they obviously have to keep with the tone and it's taken a very serious tone and downplayed as miranda mentioned um, bringing, she brought up the fantasy element, and Andor sim- really does downplay that fantasy element. So you bring in a character like Darth Vader. You bring in a Palpatine, and I'm wondering how well that works on on screen. I'm sure that it will. I'm just very curious to see what a Andor Darth Vader would 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 feel like. I suppose the best example would be Rogue One, but. Rogue One had had a little bit more of that sort of swashbuckling adventure as opposed to down and dirty, deep political thriller. I'll be very interested to see where they go in um, in season two. Uh, plus the possibility that we get another CGI Tarkin back, which I think would be pretty awesome. All right, friend of the show, a VP writes, totally agree with you, John, that Andor will not be considered classic Star Wars. In my opinion... Um, well produced it doesn't equal great story it could really be any science fiction show i need i need the mythology and fantasy element for it to be great star wars but like you said to each his own i hope you and your uh, family have a very blessed thanksgiving yes we did and still enjoying my time off thank you very much uh the lowdown show on uh, youtube definitely check that out was hopeful to, uh, for the finale but uh saying it might just be a setup for season two yeah and i actually felt like you know i mean if you ended if you went from the end of season one of Andor to Rogue One, it totally makes sense, right? I mean, and I thought, and, and I'm glad that it, that it had that feel to it. You could go immediately into Rogue One from the end of season one of Andor, and you'd be like, okay, well, this is where he ended up joining the Rebellion. We don't know what happens to these other characters, but in terms of the Andor character, we certainly know it certainly makes sense how he got to where he was. But the stories that haven't been told you know, are the characters that we've met and certainly how Mon Mothma leaves the Senate to go and end up joining exclusively with the Rebellion and, of course, what ends up happening with Luthen at the end. Lastly, Kurt S. has some things to say, starting off with Pulleys. Talking about Andor. It's got pew pew, zap zap, just not in the same quantity. Yeah, right. It's a very sarcastic sort of please at the beginning of his, and I'll get into the rest of it here because it matches the tone. But that kind of makes my point. It does have some pew pew and zap zap. It just doesn't have a lot of it. Kurt goes on to say, I hate the sequel trilogy because it's just a poorly written and executed cluster blank slathered in nostalgia. I was expecting expecting something new after 40 years. I expected Disney to have spent the time and money getting the best writers, directors, etc. I want new stories, new characters, new viewpoints, new storytelling styles, and I'm finally getting that in Andor. Kirk, thank you for the comment. Um, and that's great for you. And this falls under the it's all subjective commentary. That being said, um, they did get great writers and directors. J.J. Abrams, Chris Terrio, uh, Ryan Johnson. uh, Those are all fantastic directors and writers. The stories were new. The characters in the sequel trilogy were new. Um, In terms of storytelling styles, it doesn't get much different than Ryan Johnson in The Last Jedi. And I personally am so sick and tired of this nostalgia 
fan service argument that's put out there by a portion of the fandom. Just because a piece of, and again, this is all subjective, but in my opinion, just because you put out a piece of Star Wars content that happens to lean into or reference or show something from another piece of Star Wars content doesn't um, immediately mean it's fan service meant to bring out nostalgia. It just happens to be we're telling Star Wars stories in the Star Wars universe and everything relates to each other. So, like, you know, if, if you, like, for example, if I were talking to Kirk, in Andor, the Fondor Hallcraft with the two laser red lasers that come out of the side of it as it spins and takes up the TIE Fighters, is that not nostalgic? Because everybody seemed to be relating that scene to Darth Maul's double-bladed lightsaber in what it did. I, it, it, that, again, it had TIE Fighters. Is that is that nostalgic? I just... If you don't like a piece of content, that's fine. Personally, I think a lot of individuals tend to go to these these labels to try to try and go and justify their opinion on a particular piece of content they don't like, rather than just saying up front, "I didn't like it. It didn't do it for me." You know, I again, we're all entitled to my opinion. I've certainly been critical of Obi-Wan, but I'm specifically critical of nothing as it relates to the storytelling or the content within the show. I just think that the production quality of that particular show was incredibly, incredibly low to the point where it makes it difficult for me to watch. And I'll give you an example on this. When in the season finale, the Star Destroyer is chasing the rebel transport ship. And Obi-Wan Kenobi is debating um, and arguing about leaving and taking off in a secondary ship to distract Vader so that they can escape. If you watch one of the shots, there is a profile shot of the transport ship, this gigantic door that takes up o- over, it's, it's over half the length of the ship itself, that opens on the bottom of the ship, and this large vehicle, comparatively sized, with the Rebel transport, comes out the bottom of it. The perspective on it's completely wrong. There is supposed to be a whole host of people in that ship, and the ship that Obi-Wan takes off in is, it looks to be almost half the size of the vehicle. Like, there wouldn't have been any room for any people in the ship based off of the size of the ship that Obi-Wan leaves in. It's just, it's things like that via the production that I had such a hard a hard time with. And I and I I don't understand how that gets past the content creators and nobody else sees sees that. So, I'm sorry. I was, you know, complaining about Kirk and his uh, negativity towards the sequels and I ended up uh, complaining about Obi-Wan. So my apologies for that, but uh there was a lot of angst in Kurt's uh message there. So, I think we've gotten a little bit of everything, and that's a good thing. I know there's people that love Obi-Wan, despite my criticism of it. There's people that love the Book of Boba Fett, despite some of the problems I had with that. You know, Kirk's getting his Andor. Fantastic. You don't have to go and watch the sequel trilogy. There's a little bit for everybody. But this goes back to, like I said, and I'm going to bring it all the way back around again to sort of the future of Star Wars and Andor. I don't think the future of Star Wars is Andor. A lot of people are saying that. I think the quality certainly is. And that's what I hope Disney's paying attention to. Because you can have different styles of storytelling, but the production quality needs to be there. And with the Disney live-action content they've put out, it's kind of been all over the map. And now Andor makes everything look from a visual angle cheap by comparison. So, all right. I went off on a tangent that I wasn't expecting to go on. As always, what do you think? I appreciate your comments, even if I do disagree with them and use profanity in the emails. Not that I'm a prude, but... As my father always says, be profound, not profane, right? All right. Thank you for checking out the show this week. Uh, As always, if you want to support my nerd world and the podcast that I produce on this this platform, I hope if you're a reader or know somebody in your family that is a reader, you will check out my science fiction space opera series. Um, Inspired by my love of George Lucas and honestly, James Cameron's storytelling, I kind of landed on that recently, getting excited and hyped for Avatar The Way of Water and realized that the stories that I tell really do fall into that same sort of vein that James Cameron um, and the tropes that James Cameron uses in his storytelling because he always has these grand, high-tech adventures um, that have this romantic theme in the center of it. And I 
have tried to do that within my stories as well. So I kind of realizing, oh, you know, I was probably just as much expire, uh, inspired by James Cameron as I was um, George Lucas. Uh, my uh, my space opera series, uh, Embark, follow a ragtag squadron of pilots and one reluctant hero on a journey of survival from Earth to the far reaches of space as they fight for humanity's future among the stars. Book one, the story goes as follows. A world on the brink, a madman with an armada, only a reluctant hero can stop him. Taft Guardia picked the right day to upgrade his ship when fellow pilot Kate Amaro arrived, needing his help investigating a cryptic message from her father, an aerospace engineer who died one year earlier. Unaware that an industrial accident has set off and a catastrophic chain of events, they make a shocking discovery. As the global evacuation begins, Earth evacuees, Earth's evacuees are at risk, and Taft quickly realizes the significance of what they found, but so does the enemy. Now on the run across the far reaches of space and pushed to his limits, Taft might be humanity's only hope for survival among the stars. Treat yourself, a friend or a family member with science fiction written for adults, but great for ages 11 years old and older. Available in hardcover, paperback, and audiobook, and of course, ebook as well. I hope you'll head on over to Amazon.com, search for Embark, John J O N Justice, or MyNerdWorld.net. If you like your science fiction space opera to be epic, filled with some romance and action, Embark is perfect for you or a, fram- or a family member. Makes a great gift for the holidays as well. Amazon.com or MyNerdWorld.net. All right. As always, thank you so much for checking out the show. I hope you had a fantastic holiday weekend. And wherever you are, you are happy, you are healthy, and you are safe. I'll talk to you again next week. Bye. The Force will be with you. Always. My Nerd Road.